In today's episode, I talk about some of the greatest blue inks, reviving the finish on a Lamy 2000, and writing with the new Aurora Flex Nib. Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 161 of Goulet q and It's been a pretty busy week for me, kind of always is though. I had a really great weekend last weekend, very like family oriented. My kids went to one of their best friend's birthday parties and just had an absolute blast. Spent really good time with my parents and my, uh, my wife and my kids, and it was just really, really great. You know, just every now and then you work really hard and then you like you don't work that hard on like the business side of things and you just like have hardcore family time. That's what last weekend was. So that was really cool. Um, yeah, it's been a really strong week for me this week. Lots of good stuff, lots of things coming into place. It's been good. Um, had some cool stuff that's come in in the last week. Of course, last Friday, um, uh, we got in the Twisby Mini All Blue, which is pretty cool. Um, it's not as vibrant as maybe I was expecting. You know, Twisby was saying that it was gonna be more vibrant than the uh, blue 580. I don't really find it to be very much the case, but that's still okay. It's still a nice blue. It's still very much in that periwinkle kind of family. So I picked one of those up for myself personally because, you know, it's blue and I'm kind of a sucker for that. Um, so we uh, still have a few of those, um, but I think it's gonna be kind of a one-shot deal. So it's not gonna be like, a lot of them so um, we may be able to get some more but I'm, I don't even know if that's guaranteed yet at this point so um, you know it's they're not gonna be around long so if you're really interested in that one pick it up sooner than later also um, heard some news this week that the Pelican Edelstein Inc of the year from last year the aquamarine is looking to stay around as a regular color that was news to me. I, I discovered that on the Pelican International Facebook page. And I was like, well, okay, I guess it's staying around. So um, uh, that's kind of cool, I guess. It's a really nice color. And uh, usually the inks of the years, inks, inks of the year, ink of the years. What is the right way to say that? I don't really know. But anyway, usually when they have an ink of the year, that color is around for about a year and then it goes away and then it's gone. So um, the fact that this one is sticking around is, is kind of cool and kind of unique. Um, also have gotten in, speaking of ink of the year, uh, Smoky Quartz, which is the color for this year. So this is very much like a brown color. Um, and it's, it's, I was expecting it to be like a really deep gray brown, but it's a little different than I expected there. You know, of course, attractive bottle. The packaging on this is fantastic. Uh, but I uh, just have a quick and dirty swab for you here. So this is the color. It's very much a brown with a little bit of yellow to it. Some decent shading. You can see if you put it on really heavy, or this is just a Q-tip swab. If you put it on really heavy, um, and then it can go really light when you go lighter with it. So um, I haven't inked it up in a pen yet, literally because uh, I just got it in before shooting this Q&A here. It will have launched already by the time that this video publishes. Um, but that is something that you can pick up if you're interested. Um, no crazy properties, like no ridiculous sheen. I think the shading will be pretty decent. Um, but, uh, you know, a bunch of people interested in that ink. Um, and Pelican always does a really good job with their inks. So um, check that one out for sure. Um, got the um, Auroras that are going to be coming. I have the 88 in both the limited edition flex nib as well as the Nebulosa, which has an 18 karat nib non flex. Um, that's the purple one that's coming, and that thing looks stunning. Um, that's going to these are going to be coming in the next couple of weeks, probably. I don't have an exact date for them yet. They have been trickling in and so you may see them start to be available a little bit here and there we don't have all of ours yet so um, we're not selling them quite yet but there is a lot of interest in these specifically and i have a q a question more in depth about how this flex nib writes so i'll get into that in a bit um, but the blue one is going to be released first and then the red one is coming you know a few weeks after that maybe a month or so after that and then there'll be more colors coming. I don't know what order the, the pens are coming after that, but the, you know, I was kind of told like every few weeks or maybe every month, they're gonna be coming out with another color. And part of that is just the flex nib takes a lot of time for them to make. So they're gonna kind of stagger them out like that. And there's, there's only 188 of each color and uh, that's gonna be it. So, you know, if you're interested in those, check it out. The 88 is a really solid model of pen. So um, that's kind of cool. 
Um, also got word that the Lamy Safari Petrol is going to be here right around the beginning of April. I don't have a firm date on that yet. I'm trying to lock that in, but uh, you know, it's gonna be a big deal. I know a lot of folks are you're interested in that. Um, the pen that we had last year was Dark Lilac, which is going to be a hard act to follow, but I think Petrol is pretty strong, so it's still got the same dark trim, dark nib, uh, and then the same matte finish, but in like a dark teal color. So I'm excited about that one. I think it's gonna be cool. Um, and with an ink to match as well. So we're gonna have both of those. Again, I don't have a firm date for you yet, but they're coming, they're on your radar. Start saving your pennies. <laughs> And then, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of a whole bunch of other things that we've had coming. I was expecting March to be like this crazy blowout, you know, launch with all these new products and stuff like that. And we had so much that ended up being delayed. And that's just kind of how it goes sometimes. So I'm um, sorry about that. But, uh, you know, trying to keep you in the loop is what's going on. Uh, and so a couple other things real quick before I get into the questions for this week. If you check the navigation on our webpage, we tweaked a couple of things and we're gonna have a couple more things coming out soon, but uh, just a little bit on the navigation side. If you go to our top menu bar, you'll see it used to say writing instruments. We recently had conversation here and we're like, we have like a thousand fountain pens and like four things that aren't fountain pens. You know, cause this was, you know, a couple of years ago, we were like, hey, let's expand it to rollerballs a little bit. Let's see, let's see branch out a little bit away from fountain pens, see if everybody's interested in that. And everybody said a resounding meh and really just wants fountain pens. So, you know, we listen to you all. So we're, we're changing it back to fountain pens in that top navigation, which then allowed us to have a lot of different subcategories for things like, you know, demonstrator pens and favorite next level pens and package sets and other, you know, classifications that we can have to make your navigation easier. And then we just tweak some other things. Like we used to have the blog underneath resources. We broke the blog out as its own tab in the top menu bar now. So it's easier to find, you know, and other things like instead of saying, you know, nibs, parts, and more. It just says accessories, so we're able to squeeze some extra stuff in there. So I'm um, trying to make the navigation better for you all on our site always. And we're gonna have some more stuff that's going to be coming. We've been working on some stuff for a while, and it's not quite ready to present yet, but when it is, I will tell you it's gonna be pretty exciting. Okay, there's that, and then let me go back to my notes. Oh, and then one other thing. Um, so this is a heads up for next week. So next Friday, we're going to be doing our quarterly physical inventory. So we always like to make sure that we know what it is exactly that we have on our shelves so that we're not going to sell you something accidentally that we don't have. Um, or if we have something that we didn't know we had, we can put it for sale and you can have it. So um, we are going through and counting everything that we have. We do it four times a year. And this is the first one of 2017. So that'll be happening. Um, our team's pretty great. They do it and knock it out in a couple hours. So our side to be down um, in maintenance mode for a few hours next Friday morning. So just kind of a heads up for that. You can still browse the site and still add things to your cart. You just can't check out while we're checking our physical inventory. Cool. All right, let's get into the questions for this week, shall we? I'm gonna really try to go. I'm trying to take fewer questions and I'm still going an hour. I'm really trying to cut it down a little bit, but uh, we're gonna see how I do today. Um, I still only chose six questions today. I actually had seven, but then I was supposed to bring something from home. It was gonna be like a demonstration and I was supposed to bring something from home for the demonstration portion of it and I forgot it. So I had to cut out the seventh question. But anyway, so it's six. Um, so let's get into the first one, shall we? Starting out with pen and writing questions, this is from the V1K1, the Viking, the Viking with ones instead of eyes. Okay, um, from Instagram. Have you had a chance to check out the new Aurora Flex Nibs yet? What are your thoughts on those? Well, yes, I have had a chance. And actually, I thought this was a really good opportunity. You know, it's, it's always tough when we are in this situation where I have something where there's so much interest in a product like this, but yet I know we're gonna get so, you know, small amount of stock and it's a really high priced item like this. You know, you're pushing the $500 range for these pens. So um, I wanted to give you as much information and attention as I could, but at the same time, it's a pen that's gonna be like here and gone and then it will not be back again. Doing like a full on video review is hard to justify. Um, so I'm gonna try to cover it as thoroughly in here and then we'll try to slice it out and make it its own thing. But anyway, um, so several weeks ago when I got to actually meet the Nibmeister, like literally the, some, some folks from Aurora came and came to our place. And uh, that was really cool to get to meet them. They're great people. Um, you know, just super 
energetic, super Italian. It's just like, it's awesome. Their energy is amazing. Um, but, and they know pens. I mean, they've been doing pens certainly longer. Uh, they've been doing pens longer than my family's even been in this country. So it's crazy. Um, but uh, they uh, brought their nibmeister who actually designed these flex nibs. And uh, he doesn't even speak English. So he had to have a translator. <laughs> and so I was asking him questions and he was showing me how he did the nibs and all this kind of stuff through a translator. It was a very interesting experience, um, but it was really cool. So I got to have some more detailed explanation of how these things are actually done. Um, so uh, I'm gonna get into in just a couple minutes here um, of how they actually write, but I just wanna explain a little bit like kind of how um, they make and design these things. So first off, before I get into it, um, the pen model itself is the 88. So it's, um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so I can show it to you. It's a pen model that we haven't had here at Goulet before. So it's kind of new to us. It's not vastly different from the Optima. Um, the Optima is a pen that I have around here somewhere. I forget where it is. Um, yeah, here we go. So the Optima is one, I did a full video on it. Um, you know, a little bit different design, you know, of course it's got the uh, different pattern on it. Um, the band is more decorative and stuff like that, but the, the guts of the pen are, are almost identical. You know, very similar nib. It's got the ink window, it's got an ebonite feed on both of them, piston fill um, with a little reservoir in the back of it for extra ink. So both of those are the same. So if you're kind of a toss up between the Optima and the 88, they're not vastly different from each other. So just go to whatever one looks better to you. Um, the different thing about this one though is, is the flex nib, of course. And they're doing it in a solid color. And typically when they do the 88, they do a body color and then they have a black grip, just like on the Optimas, it's always a black grip. So for the LE on these 88s, they are doing the grip color to match the body, which I think is a nice touch. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then it's just got a subtle little Oil Roar logo here on the front. And then it's got the uh, number inscription that's on the back of the cap. So you can see kind of the finer. And they, you know, they infilled it with gold too, which is a nice little touch um, for the gold trim on these. You know, the nibs are interchangeable. You can actually unscrew the nibs uh, from the, these two models of pens. So you can either change them between 88s or between 88 and Optima. They unscrew and just screw back in as a whole nib unit. So that's kind of cool. Even if you don't have a different pen to exchange it out with, you can remove it and you can and uh, put the, uh, you know, you can use it to clean it out a little bit easier, which is kind of nice, especially for a piston filling pen like this, uh, to be able to do that. So on the right here, I have the regular nib. This is on the Aurora Optima. And on the left, I have the nib that's the flex nib on the Aurora 88. And you can tell a little bit of the difference visually just by the fact that the wings are cut differently. They're cut a little bit deeper on the flex nib. And what that does is that allows for more flexibility. It's less material, so it's gonna flex a little bit more. And from what the Nibmeister was explaining to me from Aurora was the nib itself is actually a little bit thinner so they actually thin out the material to make it more flexible. And they do uh, something different with the tipping too, uh, in order to allow it to flex a bit more. And they had to, they said they had to do all different kinds of tests um, to make sure that they could get just the right balance between softness, but enough rigidity and pushback so that you didn't just blah, mush the nib down and spring the tines immediately. Um, and they said they, they kind of went until they, they mushed it and you couldn't, you know, it was unusable kind of, and then they brought it back a little bit. So what they have now is after many, many tests of finding kind of just that right balance. And it's all handwork too that's done. All handwork and it takes a lot of time. That's why they're only doing 188 of these pens is because it just takes that long to do this many nibs. It's the only pen that they're offering this flex nib on is this special, you know, limited edition 88. And um, they're gonna be coming out in very limited numbers. Um, so they only have, I think they said they have like three or four different nibmeisters in house, but even still all of them working, of course, on all the other normal Aurora nibs, but then also on the flex ones too. It just takes a lot of time. So you're not gonna see these things just cranked out. Um, so that's why you may see kind of a high demand for these because there's just not that many pens. Um, let's see, I make sure I covered everything. So yeah, they're gonna start out with the blue one. The red one's gonna be next. I'm not sure what's gonna come after that. I know there's a few other colors that they have planned out. I saw Pen Addict did a really good review of the orange one. Um, so check that out if you haven't seen it already. Um, and then uh, I wanted to take a little bit deeper dive and kind of show you exactly how these pens write and even compare it to a couple other pens. So let's go ahead and do that. So there were uh, kind of, Three other pens that I thought to compare this uh, Aurora Flex Nib to. I got the Pilot Falcon, the Noodler's Ahab, and the Omos 
14 karat, which is of course not available anymore. Um, but the Aurora is a little bit wetter than most of these. Even though it's a fine flex, I find that it's quite wet. You know, it's got an ebonite feed, it's got pretty generous flow, and the flex is pretty good. It's a very smooth nib, I will say that. Um, and the, the wetter and the broader the nibs get, usually the more uh, smooth they're going to be, or smoother, you could say. Um, very generous ink flow. So I like that about it a lot. Um, comparing it to, you know, Pilot Falcon, I've got a soft medium nib here. Um, it's got similar responsiveness to a Falcon, really. Um, so if you like the way the Falcon works, then I think that would be a good way for you to go. Um, you know, it's, it's a similar in line variation to probably a Pilot Medium, uh, soft fine, or sorry, soft medium there. The Noodler's Ahab is gonna be finer, uh, but it is definitely con more concerted effort uh, in order to get it to flex. So it's, uh, in terms of its hardness uh, and the flexibility, it's, it's way easier to use than an Ahab, but you know, obviously there's a huge price difference there. And then kind of the, the easiest that I've used of a modern flex nib is the Omos nib, and that one is very soft, and the Aurora is not quite that. You know, I've seen some other reviews that people are starting to do online with these Aurora nibs, and they're saying, well, it's not an Omos nib, and that's true. It is a little bit different. You know, and I was talking to the Nibmeister, and um, he was saying that as he was grinding this, they did make a softer version of the flex, but it was springing too much, and they didn't want that to be an issue. And I know from selling Omos before, that was an issue with a lot of people who would buy them. So I think they found a nice balance here with these. There's really good line variation. Again, very generous wet flow. So it's not necessarily going to be the pen if you want the absolute finest line variation between, you know, thin and thick. You know, the Ahab will actually get you there a little bit more, but again, it's going to take a lot more effort to get you there. So I think if you're looking for a nice pen, a beautiful pen body, piston fill, ebonite feed, gold nib with a lot of flexibility to it that you can also use as a good daily writer, this is going to be the one for you. So there you go, I hope that helps you out. Um, just a reminder here, the pens are extremely limited, um, and so the demand is gonna be kinda hot for them, and it's gonna be a one and done deal. Like once these blue ones are done, they're all claimed already. Like we're getting shorted from what we even ordered. Um, and I know around the world they're done, so it's like, it's gonna be here and then gone. So if you're really interested in it, go ahead and jump on it because they're gonna be gone. So um, since they're not here yet, Go ahead and sign up for the email notification list on our site if you're interested in them. And then as soon as that email notification comes in, go ahead and jump on it. Um, so be ready for that. That's going to be the, the quickest and best way to do it. We'll try to give you a heads up uh, as to when we're getting them in uh, beforehand. But that's the best way to do it. All right. Next question I have is from Christian Austin Little on Instagram. Okay, so here's my question. What happens to a pen after the nib material wears off? Okay, so um, let's say you have a pen, right? You're using it, you're using it. You know, you're using a, a pen with a, say a gold or a steel nib, either way, both metal, you know, which is fairly durable, but when you're writing on paper, paper is, although it's very smooth, it's still an abrasive. So over time, that metal is gonna wear down as you're writing. Um, the reason that they put tipping material on these pens in the first place is because the tipping material is harder than whatever material is used for the nib itself. Stainless steel, gold, whatever it is, titanium sometimes, um, palladium, you name it. Um, the tipping material is going to be harder than all of those. So it's going to wear less over time than just not having tipping material. Um, but even still, over time, your tipping material could wear down. Uh, and will eventually. So if you're using one pen exclusively for years and years and years, maybe even decades, eventually you'll wear it down. And what's gonna happen is you're first gonna wear down kind of one spot. Because if it's just you using the pen, you're not evenly rotating and using it in different ways. You're using it in the same way, same spot. And so it's gonna kind of, instead of being this nice round ball on the end as you're using it, it's gonna kind of flatten out on the bottom and it's gonna be one space and you're gonna to start to get little sharp edges on here and it's not gonna feel as good as it used to. Um, so probably before you wear away the tipping material altogether, it's just gonna to start to feel scratchy and you're not gonna enjoy it as much anymore. So you're gonna probably wanna take it to a nib professional and have it reground. So if you have say a broad nib and it's this big fat ball of broad nib tippingness um, and it's nice and round like this and you're writing 
writing and writing and writing and wearing it down and it, blah, it gets this little flat spot like this. The nibmeister is going to come in, they're going to grind off the edges, they're going to get that thing round again, but then your ball is going to be smaller because you wore away part of it, right? So your ball is going to be a little bit smaller, so it's going to be more like a medium nib. And so, you know, that might be acceptable for you. So just at, over time, as you're writing with it and getting it reground, it's going to become a smaller and smaller nib until you're like, this is unusable anymore. Um, and that's how it's going to go, pretty much. So you got a couple of different options. You know, regrinding it is definitely probably the first step that's going to make sense for you, um, unless the pen is just so cheap it's not even worth it, which is totally your call. Um, you can get nibs retipped. That is again another professional service that you could get done. I think fewer nibmeisters do retipping um, because it involves welding and a lot of grinding, and it's it's a bit of work, but it can be definitely be done. Um, so that is certainly an option. Um, or in some cases, you can just get the nib replaced. Like if there's another model of that pen around, you like that pen, particular color or whatever, and you just want to get a different nib on it, you can get the nib. You know, especially if you go to like a lot of pen shows and vintage places, you can see they have part swapping and all kinds of other things. You know, you get a pen that was, you know, dropped and cracked or something over the years, but the nib is still great. You can take the nib or the front section or whatever, and you can swap it on your pen, you know. So um, depending on which model pen you're talking about, that might be an option for you as well. So there are definitely a few different options, and if you are talking to a nib professional, um, they're the ones who are going to advise you on kind of the best route to go. Um, and I think that this, this kind of stuff is where pen shows really help a lot, um, is if you have this kind of work that needs to be done, because you can actually talk to somebody, they can see your pen, they can give you advice. If they're like, oh, you need a different nib, and you know what, you know, Jim Bob over there has, uh, you know, those exact nibs, because he always does, because we do all the shows together, and I always send people over to his table, go get a nib from him, bring it over here, and I'll regret, you know, whatever. Um, that's going to be the probably the most efficient way to go about it. Um, but, you know, this is this is a long time from now that you're probably talking about if you're buying a new pen. And then it still has to be a pen that's kind of even worth it to do it in the first place. You know, and, and that's going to be a different line for everybody. If you're buying a pen like, a, you know, Lamy, it's not going to be worth it. You can swap the nib, yank it, get another nib, stick it right on there. That's the beauty of swappable nibs. It's never going to be worth paying anybody to regrind something like a Lamy Safari or anything like that unless you're getting some crazy custom grind and you just feel like doing it on that pen. Um, but, uh, you know, when you get into higher end pens like Lamy 2000s or Aurora's or things like that, yeah, okay, it starts to make sense. Having somebody pay, you know, 30, 40, 50 bucks to do some regrinding work, okay, that becomes a little more worth it when you have a $500 pen or so um, once you get into that league, if you, uh, if you will. But uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of clarity, but, um, you know, it's not like, it's not like the nib material is going to just like wear off kind of, you know, and disappear into nothing and then you're going to be grinding down into the nib further and further or anything like that. It's going to, it's going to start to write scratchy and be kind of weird uh, before you even wear out away that tipping material and you're going to want to get it addressed before that happens. All right, I got a couple of ink questions for this week. Um, the film Darkroom on Instagram. If someone said they love blue too, and what ink choice to go for, which would you say tops the list for sheening, then sparkle, best shading, and one that may not have any of those characteristics, but is just a gorgeous shade of blue? Okay, um, I love blue inks, and I could talk about blue inks for days, and you know, probably this list is gonna sound a little repetitive, but I try to mix it up just a little bit, just a, just a tad. Um, for sheening inks, um, I honestly tend to prefer like the deeper royal blues, the mid-range royal blues, um, turquoises, and like some dark blues. So I tend to not like the lighter kind of periwinkle, baby blue type colors. It's just not my thing. I'm very picky when it comes to like that. There's a lot of different blue inks out there. And even blue blacks I get pretty picky. Um, but uh, one of the coolest sheening inks that I have ever used, which is very difficult to acquire these days, is Parker Penman Sapphire. Um, very cool ink. The, uh, the, the composition of that ink is very interesting. Um, it was like a solvent-based ink, so it, it cleaned out your pen as you used it, but it did not mix well with other inks. So it was only around for a brief period in the early 90s, has not been around for more than two decades, but you can still find bottles of it around but you pay through the nose for it. it's unbelievable. But it's a deep, gorgeous, dark blue with red sheen to it. I think the best alternative to that these days is Diamine Majestic Blue. 
um, and that's a deep blue with red sheen. Probably one of my favorite blues um, easily. Um, I think Diamond Blue Velvet is also close. The sheening is not quite as intense on that one. So if you don't really like that very vibrant red sheen, but you want a little something, the Blue Velvet could be a good choice. Um, and the Noodler's Otterman Azure, I think, also is good. That's uh, going to be kind of your alternative to the Diamine Majestic Blue. If you want to go Noodler's instead of Diamine for cost effectiveness or the, whatever, the bottle label or something, the bottle design, um, I think that's, that's going to be good for you. Sorry, my mic cord is like tugging on me. It's bothering me. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, next one for sparkle is tough. I mean, any of the diamine, um, um, what's it called? Shimmer Tastics is gonna work really well. So I think you're gonna be good there. Um, Blue Lightning is probably among my favorites there. Um, Blue Pearl is really nice too. Uh, I, think, I think Blue Lightning, it's a lighter, like more of a turquoise-y kind of color, but that, that shimmer shows through really intensely on that one. So that's a really cool one. Blue Pearl I like as well, as well as the Jerobon 1670 uh, Blue Ocean. Originally they didn't have uh, sparkle in that one, but then they put it in there a couple of years later. Um, that one's got a gold sheen, uh, whereas the uh, gold shimmer, as w whereas the blue pearl has a silver shimmer. So you get a couple different options there. Uh, for shading, you get, it's really all over the map. Depends what you use. Um, I find that Noodler's Navajo Turquoise, if you consider that to truly be a blue, I know it's turquoise, it kind of pushes the line a little bit, but that's got some pretty intense shading on it. Um, probably the most intense shading ink uh, I don't know if of all time, but certainly in the blue family um, is one that I actually don't carry anymore, but it's Diatramentus Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, it, was a, it was a lighter blue, almost like borderline purpley, um, like a, a getting towards a lilac kind of color, but man, the sheening on that was intense. Um, didn't sell particularly well, so we discontinued it and had some stocking issues and stuff. Um, and I also think Noodler's Blue does really well. Of course, Liberty's Elysium is like one of my favorite inks of all time. Not, not as quite as good of a shader as Noodler's Blue, just regular Noodler's Blue. Um, and Noodler's Blue Eel is right in the mix with that as well. And I think that's because anytime you get an ink with permanent qualities to it, the shading... <laughs> Excuse me the shading factor goes down quite a bit because those permanent properties absorb a little bit more into the paper. That's just kind of how it is. Um, so that's the sacrifice there. So that's why Liberty's Elysium is not like right on my list with what you asked. Um, you know, Noodler's Liberty's Elysium definitely fits on my list um, just in terms of general blues that are awesome. So I would always recommend that one. If you like another deeper blue, Diamine Regency Blue is really good. Um, Diamine Oxford Blue is good. Um, Pilot Orochizuku Konpeki, really solid, similar to Noodler's Blue, not quite as saturated in color. So you get maybe a little, some good shading on that one too. Um, of course, I would have to mention Noodler's Bay State Blue, which kind of is a per, per, more purpley blue as well, but it just pops, like the electricity of that color is uh, unparalleled. A um, little tougher to clean out of your pen. You gotta use bleach to clean that out of your pen. A bleach solution, like 10% bleach and water, um, and that'll work uh, well to clean that out. Um, and then Diamine 1864 Blue Black, really deep dark blue black too. Those are all ones that I just really like and find very appealing. Of course, you know, there might be a lot of other opinions that you all have about that, and that's great. I think that's awesome, but you asked my opinion, so I shared it with you. So I hope you enjoy those. All right, this next question is from Arc Image on Twitter. Best ink bottles or inks for low levels? So what are the, some of the best ink bottles you can have for when your ink starts to get really low? Of course, I'll say kind of as a caveat, there are things that you can do to work around having low ink levels in your bottle um, and that don't really restrict you um, to certain things like that. So for one, if you have you know a bottle that's about to run out and you really love the color and you get another of the exact same color, you can just pour what you have into the next bottle and then you can rock and roll and you don't really have to sweat it. Um, if you're just kind of wanting to use it up and then you're gonna switch on to something else, you know, then okay, so that, that wouldn't be so much an option. A um, Couple different uh, things that you can do, one of which is, where's my ink syringe? I have my ink syringe here handy somewhere. Um, you can use an ink syringe, which I am failing to find right at this moment. That's crazy, I always have an ink syringe handy. And of course, 
I don't have it. I say I always have it handy, but have to. Oh, it's right here. Just fell out of my little drawer. Okay, ink syringe, super handy tool to have. Um, you can use it to either syringe out and directly fill into your cartridge or your converter, or if you have a piston filling pen, um, you can fill directly into the chamber if you can remove the piston, or if you have, you know, a nib that has fins on it, such as, you know, the Aurora nibs here, you know, you can do what's called the um, feed saturation method. You can drop a little bit onto the feed and then suck it in like that. So those are ways that you can kind of work around it. Um, you can put some into an ink sample vial, and that makes it easier to fill, uh, kind of down to the last drop, if you will, or much closer to the last drop. Um, so those are all some techniques that can you can do to get it kind of out of the the bottle. But if you want to talk, just talk straight up bottles, um, I can definitely get into that. So um, you know. I'll, I'll cover this stuff at the end here, just kind of forming my thoughts. Um, in terms of actual bottles themselves, so um, there's kind of two different ways to go about this in terms of how the ink makers design their bottles. Um, one is to either just have a general design where it's kind of a taller, narrower body on the bottle, um, you know, something like Robert Oster, right? It's a very tall, very thin bottle, so your ink level is going to stay higher just in general. You know, really the issue that you're going to have with your fountain pen when you go to fill it, you know, let me use this Edison uh, pen as an example. You know, when you're, you're dipping it in there, you have to submerge the nib at least up to the grip to really get a good filling. So if you have a bottle that's very low and flat, it is going to have more of that ink kind of sitting in that bottom unusable part. So having a taller, skinnier bottle works really well. Um, another thing that ink companies do to work around that is to have a design where it has some kind of chamber or a little partition or something like that where it can catch ink in it and allow you to get the nib down in there and at least fill from there. Um, so. Let me start out, you know, with some of the taller, skinnier ones. So, like, there's Robert Oster like this. Um, Diamine on their 30 mil bottles are kind of taller, skinnier like that as well. And then one that kind of, like, bridges in between the two, um, between the tall, skinny, and the little separate chamber is Visconti. So they've got this big, wide, fat part on top, and it gets much skinnier at the bottom. So you're going to get most of the ink is going to be very accessible. It's only when you're going to get down to here that it's going to get kind of tough. But they restrict it at the bottom, I think, partly as aesthetics and partly as functionality. Um, that makes it a little easier to do that. Um, some of the other bottles that I have that I think fill really well um, are ones that have kind of those separate kind of chambers like I was talking about. Like the Lamy bottles, for example, they're a little weird. They're long and flat and all that. But they have this uh, part down on the bottom where you, your nib can actually go well down into it. So you're not going to easily be able to get the part that's sitting down here on this nub, but you'll be able to get most of the remaining part of the bottle into your pen, especially with the Lamy nibs because the Lamy nibs are shorter than a lot of other nibs. For example, I'll show you the Lamy. Um, steel nib compared to say the Edison nib. So there is, you know, it doesn't seem necessarily like a world of difference, but I mean, you're talking a decent amount of ink when the bottle that's this flat um, in terms of that nib height there. So filling s at least Lamy pens, you're going to be able to get a really good portion of these out of there. Um, other inks that have that same kind of thing is Pilot Orochizuku. You know, they've got the wider kind of bottle thing going on, but they have, you know, a dip down in the middle there. So your nib is able to get down further into it. That helps you to be able to get more of the ink level out of it. Um, this is kind of an interesting bottle design, but Karen Dosh, their bottle is actually slanted. So it allows you to have your nib kind of at more of a tilt which then can allow you to get a little bit more out of it. So I just thought that was interesting to note. It's not necessarily the most efficient uh, of all of these. Um, Mont Blanc with their, you know, their shoe design bottle. Um, I don't sell this one, but uh, I have it obviously in my possession. Um, and there is once the ink level gets low, you tilt it back and it fills kind of this section over here near the opening. So that allows you to fill over there. So even if you used up most of the ink over here, it allows you to do it um, just by kind of doing that thing. So I think that's a really clever design. I can't imagine how much this bottle costs for them to make, but um, that's part of why you pay so much. Um, interesting thing about uh, this ink, Waterman, is it's you know, fairly conventional shape. It's just kind of, you know, 
it's it's angular and stuff, but it's more or less a kind of a circle. Um, uh, but because it's flat on the sides, the bottle actually tips up. So I not zoomed out far enough for you to really see that. But um, you know, if you are using, you can use it like normal. But then when you get down towards the end, you can tip it. That way you can really get your nib down in there and get kind of towards the bottom. So that's a cool design on Waterman's part. Um, and then another one I'd be it would be remiss if I didn't mention Ackerman. And they have a uh, very unconventional bottle design, which is cool. And before you ask it, uh, no, I cannot retail it because they um, are a, a smaller, you know, retailer like uh, like us, honestly, that uh, have their own ink made. And uh, they, uh, you know, are not able to wholesale to us. So let's get that right out there. But I have a bottle, so I can show it to you. So this one has like the main chamber down in the bottom, and then it has another chamber up here, and it actually has a glass ball in here. So you tilt it, the ball falls down, and then you tilt it back up, the ball blocks it, and of course it's really a full bottle. I haven't used a lot of this ink, um, so you can't see it super well, but all of the ink is up here and it stays nice and full, and then the actual ink level down here is only about right here. So it allows you to fill kind of from this top section. Um, so really clever design on their part. Super cool. I would love to sell your ink if you would let me. Um, and then just some other mentions would be some, you know, smaller bottles that are kind of made for storing and filling ink that are just not the actual bottles that you're buying, but that could be good options for you. Um, Twisby has a couple of options. They have their Diamond 50 inkwell, which can work really well, um, you know, it, with a couple of different methods in filling that one, or there's the VAC 20. Uh, so that's another option. There's the Visconti Traveling Inkwell, of course. That one works really well. That one's really easy for filling, too. So that is kind of multi-purpose there. Fills without getting your, your grip section all inked up. And then there's the Ink Miser as well, which if you're using a Noodler's three ounce bottle, you can actually take and insert this directly into the bottle. And then when your ink is getting low, it has these slats cut into it, and you tip it upside down with this inside the bottle with the cap on, and it goes in here and it in the hole, and then it fills up this little chamber. So then you just kind of fill your nib uh, from here. Uh, and then of course they have just kind of a standalone one as well if you want to kind of decant a little bit and then fill directly from the cup, not have it in there. So this is a more universal one. This is made to fit the Noodler's bottles, but a couple different options. They have it in clear now too. This is the black one, but uh, some good options for you there. All right. Um, to wrap up today, I am doing pretty well on time. How about that? Um, last question I have for today is a troubleshooting question. Just kidding. I needed to scroll down more. I have two more questions. <laughs> the next question I have is a troubleshooting question. This is from MadBeats312 on Instagram. Brian, you always highly recommend the Lamy 2000. Why, yes I do. I love mine, but like you, I have somewhat greasy, oily fingers. My Lamy 2000 is a year old, and it is shiny in places, and the cool Macrolon finish seems to be gone. Is that possible? I've washed it in mild dish soap, but it still looks the same. Any suggestion for my 2000 and all other pens? Yes, I'm going to solve your problem today. What did I do with my Lamy 2000? Here it is. Okay, so uh, I was a dum-dum, and I left my Lamy 2000 that I use on like a very regular basis at home. So I do not have that to demonstrate with you today, but I have my other one that I don't use quite as much. Um, so the Lamy 2000, it's made out of Macrolon, which is a blend of stainless steel and fiberglass. So the black part here is basically like a fiberglass resin. Um, and the thing about that is, is it's not a finish that's on the top of it. So what you're describing here is like, oh, it looks like the finish is rubbed off. It's, it's Macrolon like through and through, like the material itself is Macrolon. So the cool thing about that it's like any other resin pen that you have where it's like a solid resin. You know, if you have a pen like, I'm gonna use the Pilot Vanishing Point, it's metal and it's coated with a colored lacquer. So if I were to rub and polish and scratch this away, it would take the finish off, expose the metal underneath, and I would never get the sweet color back on my Twilight Vanishing Point. Or if I was to do that on say a Namigi Rodden and I just, you know, uh, scratched it and I don't know why I would ever do that, but if I were to do that, it would ruin it and that's all, that's all I would do because it's coatings on top of the base of the pen. Other pens like 
you know, the Edison's, it's a solid material that's turned into a pen. Same thing with the Macrolon. So it's, it's Macrolon through. I mean, obviously the inside is hollow to hold the ink, but you know what I'm saying. It's not like a Macrolon coating or finish that's put on the pen. So because of that, you can do some stuff to maintain it that you couldn't otherwise. Um, so it's not, you know, you said you tried washing it. It's not a washing issue. Um, and the fact that your hands are greasy and oily, I don't know if that really has anything to do with it, to be quite honest with you. I have greasy, oily hands too, so I kind of deal with that anyway. But pretty much anybody, just from handling a pen for a long period of time, if you have any kind of pen with a matte finish, eventually it's going to get a little bit shiny because your hands are actually going to polish up the pen. Now, if you have a naturally shiny pen, that's great because you're helping to keep that pen looking shiny. But if you have a pen with a matte finish or a pen like this one that has kind of a brushed look to it, it's not just an overall kind of matte pattern like the Lamy um, Safari Charcoal or the um, Safari Dark Lilac here. That's just kind of like a general matte pattern. The, the Lamy 2000 very much has this brushed finish that goes with the direction of the pen. And you can see that on there. Um, so it's very simple to maintain this actually. If you have some parts that are kind of polished through, um, the best thing that I've found uh, to be able to use that is actually something that's very handy. It's a Scotch-Brite pad or like a Brillo pad, um, you know, like you would have for washing your dishes. Um, I forgot, I really forgot a lot of stuff from home today. Um, I forgot to get my just straight up Brillo pad. So I have one of these like things that goes on, you know, the handle that's filled with soap and it's got the sponge with the Brillo pad attachment to it. Same concept. Um, this is like the green Brillo pad, which is a fairly aggressive one. You can get less aggressive ones. And this one is, is a little bit on the aggressive side. So you will not want to go super aggressive. And before I get into doing any of this stuff, let me just lace this with disclaimers and say, if you are going to polish or finish or do anything to your pen, scratch it intentionally, which is what I'm about to do, you're taking your pen life into your own hands. Lamy is not going to, if you do it and it looks terrible, Lamy's not going to say, oh, okay, that's a warranty thing. We'll totally cover that. No, they're going to be like, what did you do? you know, you listen to this crazy guy who told you to scratch it with a Brillo pad and now you've ruined your pen. So before you go to Lamy and say that, please don't make me look bad. This is, you're taking your pen's life into your own hands when you do this. And I'm purely telling you this for educational purposes, not so that you can ruin your pen and then blame me for it. Okay, cool. All right. But that said, if you want to give it a shot and you are a rogue and you like to live dangerously like I do, feel free to do so. Um, so you've got this pen, it's shiny. I even tried to intentionally like shine up a part of it and I was not able to successfully do so in the five minutes or so that I tried polishing this thing. Um, so I think that goes to show how hard it is to actually even do it in the first place. So you just take your Brillo pad, you can do it wet. I actually prefer to do it dry in this instance. Usually when you do it, uh, when you do any type of polishing um, like this, you would want to do it wet. Um, because it's, it cuts more effectively, but that's not really what you're going for here. You're going for uh, a consistent look. So what I do is I just take it and very, very lightly and kind of slowly, just take and kind of brush it in the direction that it's going um, and just kind of gently scratch it a little bit. And you'll look at it and you'll be able to tell. The reason I like to do it dry is because I can see every single stroke that I'm doing. And um, if you push really hard or you go really fast, you're gonna get the deeper scratches in there. They're gonna look whiter and they're gonna stand out a little bit more. That's why you gotta really take your time and kinda, of, you know, as you're going, just kinda of gently go in there. Like I can see I've got a couple of marks right there. I can go a little bit. Um, and you're not gonna to wanna to go like really intensely just on the spot that you're doing. You're gonna to wanna to go in kind of a longer stroke. And that's kind of like, you know, sanding 101. And uh, that's like a woodworking technique that I, I picked up on uh, a long time ago is, you know, whenever you're trying to sand, especially one spot to match another spot, you start out just kind of on that spot, but then you need to feather it in and, and you know, beyond just where you were. So um, that will make it look more consistent because chances are whatever sanding or device that you use is not going to exactly match the grit of what they used there. I don't know what they use there. They're pretty proprietary about that kind of thing, but I know this is close enough where you can accomplish it and it'll look a lot better anyway. Um, and as long as you're not going too hard, you won't ruin it. So you just kind of gently take it on there, go across. You can do it on the stainless steel even. It's not really gonna hurt anything. It probably won't actually do much to the stainless steel, honestly, because the stainless steel is much tougher. 
but um, you know, I think it could could work for that purpose too. Again, I don't think that the stainless steel is going to wear away quite as easily too, so it's not so much the issue. Um, but you can certainly cover that. Um, just don't touch it to the nib, then you don't want to scratch that gold. Um, but then that's pretty much going to do it. I mean, honestly, you do that a few times, you just kind of brush it off with your finger. Um, you, it'll look a little bit whiter as soon as you do it for the first time. And so you'll want to like take your finger and rub it or have like a wet paper towel or something and kind of rub it away. Um, but I find that if you just rub it with your fingers a few times, um, your oil in your hands will kind of pick up any excess um, you know, material that was left behind from the scratching and then it'll look pretty darn good if you just kind of take your time and go slow with it. You don't want to go around the pen. You don't want to go kind of diagonally because then what happens, even if you end up with a consistent scratch, if it's not straight with the pen, it's going to look really weird. So you're going to just want to be careful to make sure that you're going directly with the pen, that you're going light, and that you're only covering as much as you need to. And then once it looks good, stop. Because by going deeper and more into it, you're not helping it in anything. And I think you'll be good there. Cool. Again, full disclaimers, please don't do this wrong and then blame me for it. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then lastly, um, oh yeah, this question. Okay, cool. Um, so this is a business question from Colors and, Colors and Beads on Instagram. What are some products that are released once a year, as in would be nice co to collect? I know about the Lamy Safari or the All Star or the Pelicans Inc. of the Year. Are there any others? So this is a great question. Yes, there are definitely others. There's a lot of different things. And I thought of as many that I could really kind of reasonably show here, but I probably am not going to get them all. So just kind of a heads up on that one. There's all kinds of limited editions, special editions, things like that that crop up on kind of a more irregular basis. So usually when that happens, you'll see LE or SE or something like that. It'll be some special color of a model that's always available or some special nib type, like, you know, for example, the Aurora one, you know, this is kind of a special deal. They've never done a flex uh, on this pen, you know, like this. They did a flex back in like the 70s, but they haven't done it in a long time. So it's a special thing, but they're coming out with a series of them and that's kind of it. So I don't know if it's going to be an annual thing. So I'm, I'm trying to stick more to the, the things that are like a pretty regular thing that you can count on really kind of for collecting purposes, since that seems to be kind of where you're going with this. Um, so, uh, you know, this one's not quite as regular, but pretty much Twisby anything colored is going to be super hot. You know, this, this mini all blue is what's out right now, um, but it's crazy. I saw on eBay last week, there was a 580 all in purple that sold for almost $300. And that's just crazy. I'm like, dang, why didn't I hold on to a couple? <laughs> I don't even have one. Rachel has one, but I don't have one of those. Anyway, so certain things like that might just be crazy and kind of blow up, but it's not not definitely always not always the case um, with these things. But you know, certainly anything where it's like a regular model of pen, there's colors that come out. You know, Twisby falls a little bit more into the kind of come out with a series of colors, and it's not like a regular every year kind of thing. So um, that's kind of that, and I'll I'll touch on that and then and bounce. Um, Pelican, their ink of the year has definitely gotten there. They haven't always done an ink. I mean, Edelstein's only six years old or so seven years old maybe so they um, you know the ink of the year thing is only you know four or five that they've done so I think it's something they're looking to regularly do from here on out which is cool um, let's see here what else we got going on the of course the Lamy safaris and the all-stars you know this is the safari from last year dark lilac the all-star from this year Pacific which looks awesome. Um, Petrol will be coming out here in the next few weeks so those are always good they're around for nine months 9, 10, 12 months, something like that. It all depends on how popular and how many they make and whatnot. Um, but uh, then they are gone. And sometimes they'll bring them back um, as regular editions. They've done that before. Um, I, would, I would be surprised if they didn't bring Dark Lilac at some point because it was so popular. Um, so anyway, that would be really cool to see. But, um, you know, they did that with the blue-green. They did that with the black. They did that with purple originally, too. Um, so that would be cool. Um, let's see here, what else we got? The Edison Nouveau premieres. These are not annual, but these are seasonal. This is an exclusive that we have, um, but we design up a new one every season. So that is definitely something that's exciting that uh, gets people going. This is the Water Lily from, when was this one? I forget, <laughs> 2016 spring. Um, so, you know, it's uh, it's been around. Man, was that that? I thought, felt like it was longer than that. Anyway, um, so pen like that certainly works well. Um, pens of the year, 
Um, like the official pen of the year, Faber-Castell, this is not one of them, because their pen of the year is like $3,500. Um, it's a Viking theme this year, which looks pretty cool. But anyway, I didn't get my hands on one of those in time. Um, so, sorry, excuse me, that's a Graf von Faber-Castell. Faber-Castell is kind of like their more everyday line. Um, the Ambition is one, I don't have the Water Lily in yet, but it's coming. I just mentioned the Water Lily Edison, but there's a Water Lily Op Art Faber-Castell Ambition that is gonna be coming. It's um, gonna be a nice pink pattern with a kind of a cut weave into it. Um, and then, so that one they seem to be doing on a pretty regular basis as well. Um, what else is their Pilot with their Vanishing Point? That has become an annual thing as well that they do and they number them, it's a limited edition. Um, this was Twilight, this was from two years ago, amazing. Last year was the Black Guioche, that was really nice. This year I think is gonna be pretty cool too. I may or may not have an idea of what it is, but I cannot say one way or the other. And then, um, of course, Namiki's kind of in the line with Pilot. Namiki comes out with, it's not so much like every year kind of thing, but their new, you know, uh, Yurushi pens that they come out with, it's it's on a, such an irregular, you know, schedule. They, they come out with new models pretty much on a yearly basis. So, and they're always limited in, in number. So um, that's another thing to consider there as well. Um, you also have uh, some other things, like there's ink, it's not so much that, like the Pelican with their ink of the year is pretty irregular than most of the other companies. Like most everybody else is not coming out with an ink a year kind of thing. Um, there are some limited notebooks that come out, like for example, um, Traveler's Notebooks, um, which used to be called Midori, but now they rebranded it just under the name Traveler's Notebook. This was the blue uh, Pan Am from a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, it's got all the stickers and goodies to go along with it. Um, that one was a really interesting time for us because we got, we had really high demand for it and the stock was like dribs and drabs for a long time. So that one was, our whole team like remembers that, uh, what that was like. And I think it's gonna be kind of a similar thing with the olive that's coming up. So we're gonna have an olive passport um, traveler's notebook that's gonna be coming sometime soon. Don't know exactly when, uh, but it's gonna be the same kind of thing. We're gonna get, you know, not nearly what we order and then it's gonna come in in little bits and pieces. Um, and then the other thing that I have is field notes, which this is my field notes <laughs> seasonal <laughs> collection bin, um, which is kind of crazy. I have the, um, these are the bylines, um, which I think are, you know, I forget if they're regular or not now, but um, the utility, that's kind of current one. I got the, the snow blind one. I've got, let's see here, Ambition, Two Rivers. Ooh, Cold Horizon, that one was cool because it's blue and I like that. Sweet Tooth, I don't know if you remember that. Shenandoah, that was a cool theme, especially because I'm in Virginia. Uh, drink Local Ales. Got a little Doxy one, that was one that, a company specific one that was sent to me. Expedition, got the Lunar one, that was cool. Uh, let's see here, Black Ice with the shiny foil cover, that was cool. The Workshop Companion, the group of six there. Shelterwood, um, Unexposed, um, Arts and Sciences, the bigger ones. Um, let's see here, oh, another Shelterwood, how about that? Two Rivers, a different one. And let's see here, drink local lagers and night sky. Those are a bunch of mine. I've been collecting them basically every time, ever since we started carrying field notes, I've just been collecting one of each of them. I'm not gonna go back historically and try and collect them because it's like unreasonable how expensive some of the field notes get that are uh, older and collector edition type of things. But um, you know, it's just as we've been carrying them and they've been coming out, I just, take one for myself and go on about my business. And over time, it's happened to become a bit of a collection. So I don't know, it's kind of fun and interesting. Something, something to keep me busy. That's not packed right, but anyway. Um, but that's kind of all that I could really think of off the top of my head. Um, there may be more stuff. So my question of the week for this week is gonna feed right into that. What regularly released like kind of annual fountain pen related product, be it an ink, a pen, a paper, whatever it is, what regularly released thing has really just like got you? You know, it's like whenever it comes out, you just can't, you know, whether it's a Safari or Field Notes or something like that, I would love to hear what it is that you just has gotten you hooked and kind of, you know, like I don't consider myself to be a collector. I have quite a, a 
a mass of products over here, um, but I have not, um, I've not had much of a strategy to my collection, but certain things have pulled me in, like the Field Notes, the Lamy, Safaris and the All-Stars, and Studios, pretty much all the Lamy's, um, the Pilot Vanishing Points and all that. There's certain things when they come out, it's like, it's just assumed, like, I'm taking one. That's just going to happen, you know? And I know you all feel the same way. So I'd just love to hear what it is that kind of hooked you. Um, and that would be really neat to hear. So there you go, a little bit shorter Q&A, not vastly shorter, but I'm trying, I'm trying here, but it's still, I know you guys enjoy it, so I, I appreciate it. I appreciate getting all the great questions, the great feedback. If you wanna learn more about a lot of the stuff I talked about here today, you can check out most of it on gulaypens.com um, and learn more. Be sure to ask questions on YouTube or on the blog or Twitter, or Facebook or Instagram or anywhere that you can really, write it in the sky, hire it, you know, do a do a, a plain writing and stuff. I'm just kidding, don't do that. I won't, I won't get that. I've even gotten some handwritten ones um, that have been kind of cool. So, um, you know, definitely whatever you want to do to answer your questions. The fact that you're still asking questions is the reason I'm still doing this thing. So I'm loving it, I want to keep it up. So please keep the questions coming. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great weekend and a good rest of your week and right on.